Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Going to look at a special issue of Marvel Age, A Day in the Life of Marvel Comics. This is kind of a strange book. Uh, when I got hold of this, I, I thought it'd be perfect for us to take a look at on Cartoonist Kayfabe, recent edition. Before we open this thing up, I want to uh, do a little Cartoonist Kayfabe news at the top here. We will be at Heroes Con in Charlotte at the end of June for a three-day show, one of my favorite comic book conventions of the year. So if you're going to Heroes or you're thinking about going to Heroes, put it on your calendar, wear your Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirt for all of us to see and make sure you stop by our tables or our panels. We'll be uh, hosting several panels throughout the weekend, so should be a great weekend for comics, comics fans, and cartoonist kayfabe. So check us out at Heroes Con last weekend in June. Uh, also, like, follow, and subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that bell icon next to the subscribe button to get notified when we post new videos. It'll give you a leg up on the kayfabe effect. When you see us talk about something like a special issue of Marvel Age and you want to add it to your collection, if you have that notification turned on, you'll be the first one tracking down copies on eBay, Amazon, your local comic shop, wherever you go for back issues. Uh, sometimes it's not a problem, but without a print books, sometimes they disappear and the prices go up quick, so you want to be the first one in line for that. And also let these videos play through to the end. That allows YouTube's algorithm to share them with other comics fans who have not found Cartoonist Kayfabe yet. It's how we grow the channel, 65,000 strong and growing. So thank you very much for that, and please keep spreading the good word of Cartoonist Kayfabe to your comics fans out there. All right, Ed. Marvel Age, kind of the propaganda piece for Marvel Comics. I used to buy this. It was still being published when I started reading comics. It would previews, basically showing off whatever they wanted, the latest Marvel thing for you to buy. Yes. And um, I think early on here, maybe still figuring out what makes a good issue. This one, you see Jim Shooter here in the centerpiece. And uh, one of the fun features in the back they have all of the cast here called out. So if you're looking for anybody specific from the Marvel bullpen. Going to, going to cover me. Can, can you name some of the other people, man? Like I, I feel like I could pull a couple out. I'm guessing this is Larry Hama because sure. of the G.I. Joe <laughs> association there. And he uh, wasn't in Vietnam, too, so the dog tags are not still in Valor. It gets tough for me. I don't know. Is that John Romita Sr. working as art director here in the back? See, I thought that was Stan Lee with the with the side chops, man. It might be. Yeah, a lot of them are super tough. Like I feel like that one might be Bob Budiansky just because I know what he looks like from the toys that made us. Uh, clearly, Archie Goodwin. Yeah, Archie Goodwin's a, an obvious Probably one. Annie Nocenti. Looks like Annie a little bit. And then you start, like, you know Jim Owsley's a black dude, so he's one of these two guys right there. Uh, and uh, that's it. That's it. Maybe that's Mark Grunewald. Could be. Although he should be super young, I think, at this time. It'd be funny if there's, like, a little kid in there somewhere would be Grunewald at the time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't recognize most of them, but eh, kind of tough. And, and Try I, one of the uh, the bullpenners, you know, like one of the art guys that's in house. And there's a couple of those that are will be called out. Yeah, and a lot of these people, like you, they they never left that that the biggest mark or whatever. Like they've they've always been in administration inside the office, so you just don't. There's no reason for you to know their names. But it's fun that they have the uh, the key. So if it you're is. so inclined, you can go through there and, and kind of see what everybody looks like. Jim Salacrap editing, um, we would see him, of course, on Tom McFarlane's Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. So a guy with pretty long tenure there. And this is 1986, so this is nearing the end of Jim Shooter's run, but kind of a fun idea. You know, they talk a little bit about how this comes to be because fans, obviously, are interested in the Marvel bullpen. You know, they get letters all the time about it, or fans want to come and tour it. So this is the answer. You know, we're going to show you guys what it's like. It's really fascinating, this top ten uh books books for the month because it's there's so few of like the kind of a-list title it's almost um x-men centric uh in, in a way you know there's not one spider-man book uh that's that's on that list which that speaks to me that speaks to the impact mcfarlane had when he comes to amazing spider-man yeah and certainly the influence that claremont established with the x-men because x-men 200 is the number one book marvel heroes for hope with a big Wolverine and a whole bunch of X-Men on the cover with that with that Art Adams piece. That's that's nearly an, an X-Men comic. I, is is the is the name of it X-Men Heroes for Hope? If you have the book, I, I, I swear it's an X-Men book. Yeah, you know, I think I think I think it is, man. Like, hmm. yeah, I think it is because it's it's the X-Men bringing provisions, yeah, to some country. Uh, X-Men Alpha Flight, Paul Smith artwork on that one. Another X book, New Mutants special one that's the art adams that's this yeah. this shit right here which is fucking awesome like like what what a month man 
uh, Nightcrawler, Nightcrawler, Dave Cockrum, and and Alpha Flight counts as as an X book in a in a certain kind of way, man. They, they try to put it off as like a you know Canadian Avengers, but that shit is an X book. Yeah, uh, off the back of uh, John Byrne to get started too. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Issue twenty nine. <laughs> that, that might be just when John Byrne ends. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that he's still there, but nevertheless, here's your list of like kind of the people. Who you might see in this uh, in the bullpen, right? Consulting editors, designers, art director, pretty much staff is what you're getting there. Here's what this document is, man. Which which issue number is this? Thirty five. Thirty five. Uh, here's what you have here, man. This is the the story bible for the Mad Men type television show that needs to happen. Call it what you want, <laughs> Marvel bullpen, whatever, but. It, uh, you know, describes the day in the life at the Marvel offices, answers a lot of questions that I had, and I think the main thesis, uh, the main takeaway for me is that uh, anything that could possibly go wrong with the production of a comic book will go on every month, spread out to every editor. We're talking color issues, we're talking pages... Mm -hmm straight up out of order fedex loses a package and finds the package <laughs> throughout this day <laughs> freelancers calling up like yo where's where's my pay man i haven't got paid for 50 pages yeah i'm gonna bounce around too i'm not gonna go chronological well, this is listed as like uh, a dozen reporters were let loose in the office and the way it's written is you know you'll see like time markers at 8 40 20 minutes before the workday you know whoever's there whatever's going on and they keep kind of checking in in time and i think what happened was probably maybe a reporter in each office and then at the end of the day you compile those notes and be like okay what was going on at 10 o'clock where were all these people what was happening because that's kind of how it's written you know 9 20 just going through this time progression but cutting from office to office very difficult to read this i i did read it all but uh None of the people, whoever wrote this, they're not prose writers. They're not real reporters. No. <laughs> like, this is this is this is a bit of a slog, but it's interesting just to see kind of like who comes through the offices, but also they describe each person's office. Um, interesting Tom DeFalco's office, who would be the editor in chief whenever I start reading comics, so shortly after this, and has like Carl Barks reprints, EC volumes, European collections on his shelves. So they kind of describe the different offices and, and what's in each of them. And that's pretty fun. There is a like no joke, like twelve hour something interview with Jim Shooter on a YouTube channel called I think I think it's called Comic Book Historians, something like that. And could never I can't give you the timestamp. Somebody else uh, can 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 do that. Shooter talks about the production of this and describes how angry he was that it was set I this is me trying to recall that uh these photos it the separations were sent to the like color chem chemical company, like hand separators and Mag magazines don't do that right. for photographs. So when you see stuff like this, or like the off register and the um, mores that are happening, it's because they just produced it like they do like the regular comics, and and this kind of job doesn't doesn't work. They with that. say it somewhere in here. Oh, like they're they? not sure how it's going to reproduce. It might be Salakrup at the beginning in his editorial, uh, but yes, obviously this is not your typical Marvel production. So we'll see what happens. Look at how hot that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's very bizarre. My first glance through this, I was like, is the registration way off? And and it doesn't actually look that off. I think it's just that doing a photographic process like this, very new yeah. to, uh, to the Marvel production. Yeah, and you're using like the weird dots and stuff. Like, you know, there's there's handwork being done. Some of the books that are in production uh, during this period uh, is um, they're just getting like the proofs and all that stuff back for that X-Men issue 200 that is the number one book of this month yeah a lot of the stuff i think x-men uh or marvel heroes for hope is being like edited in this during this day which also on that list yeah absolutely uh there is the germ of the barry windsor smith x-men comic with wolverine and, and the chick from power pack that we did two episodes of <laughs> uh that is in the germ stage where they're trying to woo barry windsor smith to draw the thing. Chris Claremont is calling Barry Windsor Smith, trying to, just trying to um, sell him on the idea. Uh, another piece that is in conversation 
is the uh, the Daredevil graphic novel, I believe. Yes. Uh, Bill Sienkiewicz comes in yeah. because there's contract issues. Yes. And I don't know if it's the Daredevil graphic novel or the Elektra assassin because they talk about Elektra and the Daredevil graphic novel in here. Yeah. And we've heard that it was they didn't know how to pay him. Yeah. So they paid him for like I think pencil, ink, and color. Yeah. <laughs> for painted pages. So I think that he's in there trying to get that sorted out. Yes. I I recently bought a grip of old Amazing Heroes, and uh, just looking through some some random issues at the news watch and stuff. The Daredevil graphic novel was being solicited in the pages of uh, Amazing Heroes as a two issue mm-hmm. arc of just the regular comic and the pitch, you know, the, like the little blurb, it's it is this it's the story. Right. You know, they just fully expanded on that once the graphic novel format became a thing. Once they saw this issue and were like, I don't know how we're gonna do print. Uh, we can't. We can't show <laughs> what will happen to Scavenger's art. Well, in this no, process. I, 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 it was not. There was no indication that it was going to be a painted thing. It was just going to be a pen and ink, yeah. you know, like a Moon Knight looking Sienkiewicz job. Larry Hummel with a shirt that says something like Uzi Kilia or something. Yeah, what is? I, they, they call it out in here somewhere. Um, yeah, it's funny. I was looking at that, and it's like you see these dudes that are like suit and ties, uh, you know, very formal. Larry Hama looks like the coolest dude in the room in his t-shirt and jeans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Once again, it's the, it's the Vietnam dudes who, like, rebel against dress code. Uh, you, you see the names called out here, man. And there's there's real fun stuff, like a super young Dwayne Turner, I believe, mm-hmm. is uh, sending submissions and yes. is, like, hopeful, like, he might get a job. Like, that's pretty cool. Mark Silvestri is mentioned. Yeah, there, there's some real interesting bits in terms of that, like projects that are going on. Mazzucchelli shows up, yeah. and he's just about, I think he's about to start on the Miller run. Has to do the cover. Daredevil, and uh, is, is in the office because he's interested in like taking on more responsibility with coloring. Yeah. So it goes back to that interview we often talk about with Mazzucchelli of like, you want to touch the book last. He's coming back from that like long Italy Italy trip that I think Richmond Lewis got for school. or Like there there's some... She had an opportunity, and he came along and was FedExing his pages back. But they need uh, they need a cover for uh, for that Daredevil. But Ralph Macchio, the editor, doesn't even have the plots or anything because they need the blurb. But he gives Simonson and he gives Frank Miller like all the wiggle room he possibly can for their own process to evolve as it will. Yeah, it's kind of interesting the way he calls that out, because it's sort of like, well, you could still read it. Like, you know, it's very hands-off on the editor's part to give Miller free freedom or whatever, but you still could be looped in. The, My the, takeaway the way was, it is, it's so it's, busy. It doesn't exist. Yeah, it's so busy for all these guys that, like, if, if you can have Frank Miller off doing something, just let him go. That's the other thing, dude, is, like, I think I read stuff in there about, like, Chris Claremont doing paste ups and things like if you're in there, this is not this ain't Hollywood. Yeah, they're putting it, you to work. Yeah, this is not Hollywood where it's like if you touch that fucking wire on the ground, you are impinging upon my professional duties, and I will call my shop steward. Uh, there's no no unions here, man. You come in, man. You better like know how to use the wax machine. They uh, John Romita talks about doing photo, touching up photo stats for Marvel Tales. It's so fun, like some of the production stuff that is in here. Some of that is some real uh, broom pushing bullshit because Marvel Tales, the fucking comic was done 15 years ago. What do you have to read? <laughs> you know, you're, you're bollocksing up the whole thing. Like, I'm sure you have a ton of responsibility, but you can't put that one as a priority in the article. Give me a fucking break. Well, that that also comes through is like there are books that are due at the printer, yeah. And it's kind of like, are we going to make it in time? I think there's there's a couple that go throughout here. Epic Illustrated, they need a text piece from this person, this person. They're waiting on something else, and it's due, you know, in two days or whatever. Uh, it's kind of fun seeing that stuff as they're putting out fires and also like handing out jobs to people, trying to keep them on the, you know, like like one guy shows up a freelancer doesn't have anything to do his the script isn't ready for his next job shooter gives him an inventory cover do a spider-man cover poster style yeah you know who that is it's freaking uh larry lieber yeah he's coming in like what do you got for me hey my brother stan lee what what do you got for me to do (laughs) yeah he finds something for him somehow to get paid there uh the official 
Handbook of the Marvel Universe is something that Mark Grunewald is working on throughout this, doing mostly like text adjustments and things like that, writing, uh, you know, backgrounds for some of these characters that have like two, three iterations and only one of them is written. So he's also, filling in those gaps. That seems like a huge job, that he, Marvel Universe. He's also a con- continuity snob. Uh, and also, I think I think that's the kind of job that you, you give to that kind of guy. You know, he was he was in fandom doing basically the same thing. Him and uh, Paul Levitz were like the tandem. You know, one went to DC, one went to Marvel. So he jerks off at that. That's that's porn to him. Right. It's, it's not that big of a deal. Shouts to my man Phil Felix, man, my lettering teacher from uh, Qbert School. They're doing um, working on a new. Thor graphic novel that Paul Ryan's going to draw and Vince Coletta's going to ink. Shooter's such a Vince Coletta mark. He's talking about how he wants him to make it look like the old Thor, like Kirby and Coletta. Okay, yeah. So we're going to see a photo somewhere, man, of uh, of Uncle Vinny in here. And say there is that Mad Men TV show. We got to find that real quick, man. It's got to be Billy Bats, Phil Leotardo that plays uh, Vince Vince Coletta, man. Where is that shit? We gotta find that. That's super important. It's it's just kind of going through. I like seeing Fred Hembeck too. It was in these early Marvel ages, so you get a centerfold of Fred. And day in the life of Fred Hembeck. Yeah, he knew that this was coming on, so, <laughs> like the, this kind of thing. So he did the Day in the Life. Pretty fun. Like he he's a guy we talk about all the time about doing some kind of coverage of. So we'll get more Fred Hembeck on here at some point. There you go. <laughs> Look at there that, you man. go. Hey, hey, Jim Shooter, go get your fucking shine box. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel like that a little bit, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> Give Vinny some work. <laughs> <laughs> Where's that pinky ring, man? Yeah. Go get your fucking shine box. I think that's a cigarette in his hand, but I think there are, there's talk of different people having cigarettes, too, in the office at the time. You know the other thing? Uh, and, you know, like, I, I started drawing comics professionally age 21. I had, like, a few jobs in my life. They had the video store had a uh, hanging drywall with my uncle, and then I spent like a year and a half, two years at that call center. Uh, but I was still young as fuck, you know? And today, it's like trying to figure out how to schedule dentist appointments is, is tough, and and, and uh, like carving the time to go to the bank is tough. And I do think about like, so you work a nine to five job and you have to, you have to participate or do something, you have a task that is at a nine to five, Monday through Friday establishment, how do you get to do anything? You have to call off to uh, go cash your check at the bank or something. Like, how do you do that? And the answer for the Marvel people is, you just leave. You just yes. you just you just get out of there for twenty minutes or something. And I guess maybe in New York it's a little different, where like the bank is just the next building over or something. It's it's like five minutes away, and then you just come right back because I'm sure there's a million banks everywhere, but. Uh, there's a lot of people leaving their jobs. I used to, you know, like my, my job was kind of an office job, nine to five. And uh, there was one dude, he would just go see a movie, like at least once a week, he would just leave the office and go see a movie. Yeah, man. Like just that last gig that I had, it was like very strict, like nine minute breaks, uh, two nine minute breaks on an eight hour shift. And they do not have to give you a lunch, but they like tell you that they're doing you a favor. So uh, I feel like you, like at my joint, you would just get tossed. Yeah, you know, different different rules. It depends, I guess, how, what kind of work you're doing and how closely they're watching it. Yeah. We had some, some time to kill uh, at my job, I suppose. <laughs> um, trying to think of what else stood out in this. There, there are, I think, are two dentist appointments here, Ed, you know, to illustrate your point of people coming and going, leaving early, coming in late. <laughs> I got a couple good ones. No, I, no, I just see uh, this thing. Time to pay some bills. Ed Piscor and I are working cartoonists. The best way to support cartoonist kayfabe? Buy our comic books. Red Room, Trigger Warnings, Issues 1 through 3, now available in comic shops everywhere, barring uh, 28 countries and I think 11 comic shops where it's banned, but you can ask for this and order it from virtually any comic shop. Who knows, they might pull them out from under the covers. Red Room, Trigger Warnings 3, the second season of Red Room, every Red Room cover self-contained, so pick up whichever one you find and you'll get a complete story, along with Red Room Anti-Social Network, the trade paperback of the first season, available now wherever books and comics are sold. Hulk Grand Design, Monster Madness, a retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk. I am writing, drawing, coloring, lettering, the whole shebang, the Grand Design way. And this is available now in comic shops everywhere. Both issues, the complete story of the Incredible Hulk's rich history. Pick that up now wherever comics are sold. And back to our regular scheduled programming. So uh, the second Jim Shooter. Jim Shooter, it doesn't, at least on this day, we'll say, it's not uh, the captain is the first on the boat and the last out. He shows up at like 
1130 after almost all the editors are there. And the first guy in his office is Bob Layton. <laughs> and, and Bob Layton comes sniffing in there like a couple of times. And I thought that was funny just because of uh, the Valiant Comics stuff and how close Bob Layton is to uh, the henchmen of Jim Shooter uh, during that round. And they, they, they leave at the end of the day together to go to the gym. <laughs> and by the way, when they're describing the offices, there's a weight bench in Jim Shooter's office. <laughs> that's the that's the Bob Leighton weight bench. <laughs> <laughs> Bang out some reps while you're going over a plot. I say that because I see Janet Jackson's name here yeah, also. Yeah, she's mentioned there. I think she's in this uh, opening credits group. I wanted to mention that too. Design, Janet Jackson, uh, famous colorist from Valiant, that but, original Valiant group. But speaking to the all the responsibilities, like she has responsibilities of like doing like logo designs or something yes. for this. Also, another thing that's uh, worth mentioning is, uh, can you take a look at the Indicia real quick and give me give me a, a sense on the on the year? Uh, yeah, it's February nineteen eighty six. Okay, so there are numerous um, licensed properties that are coming through uh, the Marvel offices. I'm glad you mentioned this. And uh, I just I imagine that with with uh, Hasbro, the the business mm-hmm. they did with Hasbro. Was was huge stuff, man, and the deal that they did with uh with Star Wars was was, yeah, was big work. Star Wars, Transformers, Thundercats. Uh, they're doing stuff with Jim Henson, uh, Muppet Babies. This is all new. Yeah, the like, Sectars, like it's all new stuff. And uh, GI Joe, of course. When you watch the toys that made us, the Transformers episode and the GI Joe episode, you see that like the mythology that you know from from your action figures, man, it comes from the toy guy, uh, from the comic book guys. Jim Shooter had the idea to make G.I. Joe a unit rather than, like, have G.I. Joe and G.I. Steve and G.I. Dawn. Like, that's the unit. Uh, Archie Goodwin's a guy who's, like, they fight a terrorist organization called Cobra. Like, he just had that in the back of his pants and and said that. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes a whole thing. Um, Bob Budiansky is the guy who creates Optimus Prime's name and Megatron's name. Like, and the mythology of... uh, of, um, you know their their home planet and and Cybertron and Cybertron and and the idea that they're looking for energon cubes, looking for resources on Earth, like that Jim Shooter came up with that. Uh, so the Marvel people, there's all this mention and they're vague about some of it, uh, but they're talking about like there's like a whole wing like in staff doing toy design stuff, color things, yes, uh, help helping out. Basically, these toy companies discovered you could pay people a lot less money. If you go to Marvel right. to like do do all your work, than to pay like the actual designers in house. In fact, you might be able to get Marvel to pay you a licensing yeah. fee to be able to do those comics and, and, and just write stuff for you. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a clever scheme. I'm glad you mentioned it because there's so much licensed stuff. Uh, Star Comics are a big piece of what Marvel's doing, like the the all ages stuff. Planet Terry comes up several times. Uh, there's some kind of I think that might be what they lose art for or something. There's some kind of deadline issue with that. Uh, with the licensed stuff, though, they mention every stage has to go through approvals. Oh, yeah. So penciling, inking, coloring, lettering, every stage, what a pain in the ass. Oh, yeah. What a nightmare. Yeah. Another thing that uh, is, is it sort of made me think about my time with Harvey P. Carr, where uh, pencilers get hold of um, the plots, you know, and it's Marvel Method or whatever, so it's reasonably vague. Uh, so these pencilers are, like, calling in the office, like, uh, where's Tony Stark staying right now? Like, what, mm-hmm. what's his apartment? Like, is he at the apartment or is he at like a compound? Like, what, like I know Secret Wars is going on, so is he on a different? Like, where is he? And I remember having to call Harv a bunch because his shit is just stick figures and shit. And I'm like, Carve, do you want to give me any indication <laughs> of like uh, who? Like, I knew that the triangle on the head is a female because <laughs> that means hair. That's a haircut. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but any any idea? Of the location, no, oh, just don't draw. Hey, Harv would just be like, just don't draw capes on him. <laughs> just don't put a laser gun in his hand. <laughs> It'd be funny to see a Harvey Pekar comic where it's like Rob Liefeld finished the art, or like uh, you know there was like some of that great uh, Chris Ware stuff. Uh, is it I guess where it's an autobiographical tale, but the but the imagery is like a golden age like Superman comic. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With yeah. The circle panels and it's very Siegel and Schusterish. <laughs> Yeah. Could have been a groundbreaking uh, American Splendor strip. Punisher number one is mentioned here. This is the miniseries. It's already running late. Punisher number one. If you guys remember that that miniseries, I think it went from like four issues to five issues. I think there were delays. There might have been a uh, is that some, the Mike Zach? Yeah, Mike Zach. But uh, it's already behind schedule here. So 
the, the stuff that's behind, there are several books that are behind schedule that they're trying to work out. Gru is one of them. I think there was a coloring issue uh, is the reason for the scheduling, but they're trying to make sure they get it on track for the next month. It just seems like such a headache. There are voucher issues where artists aren't getting paid and they're trying to figure out, let me check the vouchers. Did you turn those in? Did they get lost somewhere? So it does feel like, man, the headaches involved, like, this does not sound like a fun job. It's putting out fires. You know, it's it's putting out fires constantly. They're trying to coordinate San Diego Comic Con, I think, is like the week after this. and then or, or two weeks maybe. And like Chicago Comic Con is also in that mix. So like in the next three weeks, they have two big shows. So they're trying to coordinate both editors, but also like freelancers. Who's going to be where? Who are they flying different places? How long are they staying there? While they're in San Diego, then they want to go to uh, Lucas Films afterwards. Um, oh yeah, they have to go to Lucas Films to 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 bat out the like the next you know year's worth of plots right. for the Star Wars comic. Uh, I think it might be Kelly Jones on Micronauts gets a cold yeah. or, or a flu yep. and and is going to be behind deadline. Yeah, when you read this stuff, my takeaway was like I can't believe half these books ship on time or consistently. And I mean, like for the most part, the trains ran pretty well for a long time. I, th- I think that's a myth, man. Uh, like shooter got this stuff running back on track and things, but, uh, books were late a lot. They like by, by at least a couple of weeks here and there, man, it's just like you wanted, you wanted the average to be better than what it was, uh, before shooter got there, which was, you know, so many books, were uh in had to be inventoried but but by the way that's another responsibility like on top of all of the actual regular stuff you have to have and it's the editor's responsibility to also use whatever whatever money they have uh at their disposal to build contingency plans and have inventory stories done so that a guy can uh lay up with the flu and not have to worry about uh, get, getting things in on time. So, like, that's another part of your thing, like, where you have to get just extra work that might be used at some point. Like those covers you were talking about that are poster-ish with no storytelling elements. Shooter, uh, one of his tasks throughout this is he's scripting Secret Wars 2. Yeah. And they, they kind of talk about that and how difficult it is to do that because of, like, coordinating all the characters and all the different offices and stuff. It makes it sound like he's... Uh, that's a thankless job that he's that he's handling that one. Yeah, it definitely is like uh, after mag piece to it because they're extolling how great a guy he is, man, by taking actual like vacation days. He's taking his vacation time to write uh, Secret Wars two, and they mention it. I just feel like that that's a suck up. Uh, piece of shilling right there we're not going to see the end results but they're talking about one of these issues that's going to be due like tuesday and lining up colorists who can color it basically the night before yeah (laughs) that goes around the room uh several times as as freelancers come and go it's like everybody gets approached for this many of them turn it down but someone's going to get stuck with that task some of the other freelancers that make appearances kyle baker Mm -hmm. pretty pretty early in his in in uh his career ron friends doing some spider-man work gets a phone call doesn't make an appearance here but gets a phone call um, there's a She-Hulk graphic novel that they have to try to figure out something was wrong with the logo treatment. So they're making like adjustments after they've seen the color proofs of that. And one of the subplots, just trying to figure out this Fed- Federal Express package that broke open and missing art and all kinds of stuff. Made me wonder, like, if somebody, if, if some art goes missing at FedEx on the way to the office, it has to be recreated. Are you getting paid twice for it? You must. Like, who's 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 footing that bill, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you must, man. Like, that's a... Uh, yeah, it should be insured. It FedEx, insured. it should be insured, so... But FedEx is bullshit. Like, it, did did you ever insure stuff through FedEx? I have, and I've never had to, like, claim it. I never have either, but they but you can't claim $30,000 of insurance. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can't It's do. like $1,000 is, like, their maximum. I've had issues with that, like, for art shows and stuff. Exactly, yeah. So so it's like you're not getting the full amount. And, and I bet if you try to claim it, there will be issues. Like, how are you going to prove that that those twenty two pages of comics are worth one thousand dollars? Yeah, really. Hey, here's that part, Ed. You mentioned Barry Windsor Smith drawing that X Men comic. So uh, Ann calls Barry Windsor Smith, and you know, talk about this story. It's like Frankenstein's monster and the little girl. Yeah, that's that's pretty that's cool that's description. A good way to sell it. Yes. There's one lady who comes in. She's a writer, and her husband's a an artist. And she comes in after like the husband like pulled a full all-nighter to get these pages in and it might be some bullshit star right. comic t- planet terry or something and uh she comes in the next day she doesn't have the pages 
and and, him. and they don't have the heart to go call and like <laughs> like she's like you know he just got to sleep like i can't <laughs> i can't you know i can't call the guy right now here's our young chris claremont young sitting, 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 sitting in the well. office with uh yeah conferring with the editor there and we're basically getting to the to the end of this here's your Dwayne turner hopeful young penciler that's fine. trying to get some work and uh, that's basically it. Most everybody's leaving between five and six o'clock. I think one guy sticks around. Look who compiled uh, Kurt the, Busiak. Yeah, before he was really doing work, man. Yeah, and then a list of uh, a list of reports from various people here. Kurt being one of them. Len Kaminsky. There's there's a few guys on here you'll recognize their names probably as maybe future creators. So this is the Bible, man. This is the uh, the the legend document for uh, the. This should be the Marvel Studios pitch for uh, for TV. It doesn't have to be WandaVision. It doesn't always have to be superheroes. It could be it's a office. great I- This is a great idea for a show. Like considering where the Marvel universe is in terms of pop culture, like this would be incredible. The only funny thing, the only like lacking part that you can't even imagine being able to weave into such a such a chaotic and nerdy universe would be any kind of love triangle. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Like, I was thinking of the Simonsons, right? Sure. That'd be, that'd be somebody, maybe. I mean, but but there's no triangle. They're just... Oh, a, triangle, a, a, right, triangle, They're yeah. just a happy couple. I was just thinking of romance subplots running through, but... Uh, yeah, there must be some kind of dirt floating around. Maybe some uh, some interns or assistant editors. Yeah, it would just have to be manufactured. You would. That's the thing that I think you'd have to do. It, it would all be kayfabe. Yeah. You know, like, you'd take a few of the big known personalities and some of the anecdotes that exist with them... And build stories around those, but mo- almost all of it would just be yeah. All the fake you have to have build in fake editors and stuff so that you can uh, give somebody a drug problem, uh, have you <laughs> yeah. know like all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> all see, the drama that you can put in there. See, we're doing your work for you. Um, it does seem like rich material though, and and visually, you know, you could have all kinds of artwork flying by. You know, you could kayfabe a lot of that stuff. You could have a little cosplay action. You could have a Comic Con scene here or there. You can imagine a freelancer taking too many pills and stuff after like a phone call from Jim Jim Shooter. That's like... where your drama comes in, or those. Uh, I was up all night finishing these pages, <laughs> showing up at the office, and a voucher's not right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. That's a great idea. Good to go. Yeah. Okay, favors like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design Monster and Hulk Grand Design Madness are now out in comic shops everywhere while supplies last. It's my retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk. I'm writing, drawing, coloring, lettering, all of that stuff. Two oversized issues, perfect for a first-time reader or a longtime fan. You can also join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see more of my comics and download some out-of-print zines and mini-comics. And join us at Heroes Con in Charlotte at the end of the month. Uh, we'll be doing panels. We'll have artwork, prints, comics, all that good stuff. So check us out at Heroes Con later this month. Red Room Trigger Warnings Issue 1, 2, 3, and 4 are on the stands as we speak. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit is the name of the game in Red Room Comics. Every issue is completely self-contained. So if you see an issue, scoop it up, give it a sample. If you dig it, grab another. Uh, it is banned in more than 28 countries. It is banned in more than 10 comic shops, but you'll be able to order and pre-order these comics at my link tree in the description below this video. It is available at finer comic stores everywhere, however. And if you want to read it right now today, go to my Patreon, patreon.com slash edpiscor. Three bucks get you the archive there. I have more than 200 pages up as we speak. And uh, new strips go live every Tuesday. What else do we have out there, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist KFAB newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist KFAB t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. That's another great way to support the Cartoonist KFAB channel, and I want to see those Cartoonist KFAB shirts uh, flying high when we're at uh, Heroes Con next weekend. Jimmy, given the marching orders, we'll be on our way. Make more comics.